Over the next 12 minutes, we're gonna look at the most common Python beginner mistakes so you don't make them. I'm gonna share with you what they are and how you can fix them in your code. Welcome to the video. All right, guys, I'm gonna rapid fire the most common Python beginner mistakes that I see almost every day in the classroom. These are kind of in order of the most common ones, but uh, I guarantee some of these you don't know, you're probably doing, uh, and other ones you may have already heard of or seen. Now, the most common one I see is just confusing data types, and this most commonly happens with string and integers or string and floats. Now, when you print this, the issue is, right, age is a number. We can't use the plus operator on a number with a string. You would have to use a comma here, which is kind of inconvenient. Now, the better way to actually handle this is, well, two use cases. One, I don't want the type error, so we could use the string function in age, but a better version that you should just get accustomed to is using an F string. This allows you to drop an outside information dynamically. It doesn't really matter the type of data. Another habit that you should pick up that would help with this is using what we call type hintings. This is gonna help you pick up those errors faster and easier. Now, when we run this, it doesn't matter this type of data or this type of data, the F string handles it all for us. Now, the next common issue I see is not using the right operators correctly. This is super basic for a lot of us. Others, it's okay, this happens. This is gonna result in a syntax error because using a single equal sign is what we do with variables. But when we're working with logic, we need two equal signs for this. That's gonna throw you an error. This goes for greater than and equal to, less than or equal to, not equal to, or two equal signs. If you're in an expression, we're doing logic, always two equal signs. The only time you use one equal sign is with a variable. To better improve this with what we just covered in the first error is I should be doing a type hinting and then ideally if we convert this to an F string this would be output much better. Now if I run my code it is going to print X is 5 because we're using two equal signs. As you get working with data structures, you're inevitably going to build functions that you give lists to. These are our mutable default arguments. Now, when I call this code, right, I'm appending an item to this list and I'm returning the list. We're gonna add one, we're gonna add two. This code block I'm actually gonna run for you guys. Let's take a look real quick. And what do you expect to happen based on this code? Well, you can see the list is one and the list is one, two. Uh, in an ideal world, maybe that's what you want, sure, but I'm giving an empty list. This is unexpected. I shouldn't have a list with one and two because when I call the function, right, we're giving it an empty list. This is not the way to handle this. When we have these, we need to better improve this. One, ideally, I'm giving my type hintings. We're giving our keywords int in list, but I don't want to give a list to it. In fact, we want to give none. The first thing we should be doing as developers is really checking. Uh, if my list is none, then we want to initialize my list inside the function. Otherwise, we can just append the item to the existing list. Now, when we run this, instead of seeing what we had before, here I get exactly what I want one and two, because initially we're checking. The list is none. If the list is none, we create a new list. Then we do what we want to do. Always run checks before we start changing types of data, before we start changing data structures in our code. If you guys are finding this video helpful, hit that like button. Let me know which one in the comments you're actually doing wrongly that you can change and subscribe if you're not already to the channel. That helps me out immensely, so thank you guys so much. If you're just kicking off your Python journey, the links in the description are dedicated for you guys, okay? The first link below is my Python masterclass that takes you from A to Z covering everything you need to know to master Python just in the next couple of months. It's got everything you Need, check it out. The other links down there are my weekly Python newsletter, absolutely free, my ebooks, as well as our Discord community. So come join Discord or the newsletter and join in on all the action. Back to it. This next one here, I see more than I'd like to see, and it's a really common beginner error. It's when we forget to return a value. A function's job is to do something and return a value, right? When I print off this function, if I'm not returning a value, it's always going to return none. 
This is wrong. This here in itself returns none. Always return the value. You could either say return result, or in this case, a more optimized version is return, right? When I change this now, we're actually going to return the value that the function has done, and this is gonna output the correct code. So if you're printing off and you're getting none from your functions, it's because you're not returning the value. So double check your work. Typically when working with for loops, an issue that I see a lot of my students get is, well, it doesn't start on the number you want, or it doesn't even end on the number you want. In this basic for loop, right, I'm going for a range of five times. It prints off correctly, but it starts on zero, and I want to start it on one or a different number. The obvious answer is to go to and say, I want to start at one and go until five, but the issue is what? When we run that, we're missing that number we want to go to. It's because we're not reading this correctly. Okay, the first number is the starting number, and the last number is you want to go up in two, not including this final number. Now when we run it, we get the exact output you want. So just remember that this loop, this range function, isn't actually going to trigger on this last number. No, it stops just before this number. As long as we give it a starting point, it'll start there. It's going to end before this. Now the next common mistake is once you start working with data structures, you can see here I have a list called A, and oftentimes people want to copy a list to reproduce it or use it in a different way. Other videos, other documentation, it says, hey, I can just make a variable B and assign it the value I want it to be. So now I have a list called B that is the list A. This seems to work, right? But now watch what happens. I append 4 to B, and I'm going to print off A, just to make sure that A still prints 1, 2, 3. What do we expect here? I expect 1, 2, 3. But no, that's not the case. When we do this, you're actually altering the state of the original list. We don't want to do this, okay? A much better way to do this, Python has it built in. We can say A, there's the copy function. This allows us to make a clean copy of the existing list without changing anything to it. Now when we run this, I'm left with one, two, three, that's good. And when I go to B, right, B is my updated, it's the copy of the list, now we're left with one, two, three, four. So don't just update the variables. Use the functions Python has, use copy when trying to copy a list. This is another super common error I see all the time. This is why naming variables, naming functions is so important. Don't repeat yourself. Use descriptive names. Never ever name something a built-in of Python. List is already a Python word. Never use the name of a Python word in your variable because this is going to work. But later down the line, let's say I want to use the list function. Right? And I want to add a string 1, 2, 3 into a list. This now list function is inactive. Right, It's now inactive because I used it up here. We never ever want to do that. So always make sure that you use good variable names. For example, numbers is a list. I established a variable now that, that contains this list. When you use good variable names, you can use the Python keywords elsewhere. Always choose good descriptive names. This runs my code. You can see this is the output that we wanted now. We're not interfering. As you start working with files, you're going to be introduced to the open function. Open allows you to open different types of files or images, and we can work with them. Then the most common type is a write file that has text in it. Write is a function that allows me to write something inside of this text file. But a lot of beginners don't actually close out these files. We need a sequence of operations. I establish a file, I write in the file, but we forgot to close the file. Yes, you could technically come out here and say close, but this doesn't always work correctly. And in the grand scheme of things, what happens here? We open a file, we do something with a file, we close a file. These three steps can be sped up just by using the Python with keyword. With is what we call a context manager. It handles the opening and the closing automatically for us in a much safer and cleaner format. This way, I don't need all this code. This is going to do the same thing. 
I can open my file, I can do whatever I want with it, and when I exit this context manager, it's automatically gonna close it for us. So start using with when you're working with files or external data to open things, do something, and then automatically close them when you're done. As a beginner, you start learning these Python keywords, and you're like, hey, that's cool. I'm going to start using that. And oftentimes, beginners start to think that is just means equals, right? A is B. A is equal to B. I mean, in English, this makes sense, right? But when we run the code, it doesn't output that, right? It's false. Why is it false? What is is actually doing? Is checks for identity. A is the same as B. Well, they have the same elements, but they are completely different objects. Don't use is when checking for equality. This is why we have the double equal sign. Now I can run my code. The first one is still false because they're completely different objects, but the values of A and B are the same. This triggers our condition to run. So you learn these Python keywords, but understand what they are. Is does not check for equality. It checks for identity. The double equal signs checks for equality. A final common mistake that I see often is trying to remove items during a looping process. Now, while this might work on smaller lists, as your data structures grow, this is not the best way to do it because as the loop continues, the internal index of our loops are moving forward. Eventually, this is going to cause issues. So try to avoid doing this. Don't do this. The more optimized way to handle this is to use list comprehensions. I have my initial list. I update my initial list, but now we're using a comprehension to actually loop through that. Not only is a list comprehension more readable, so this is going to optimize your code, but it's cleaner and safer for removing items as we're trying to loop through. But just be sure, right, we don't want to overuse comprehensions. Just because you learn about comprehensions doesn't mean that you have to convert everything to it, just where it makes sense, where it's optimized to do so. This is the final step, and this is the final mistake that I see. So try and look back on these mistakes we covered today and see where are you using them in your code? How can you change your code to make it better? And there you guys have it. Those are the most common beginner mistakes that I see in the classroom on a weekly basis. You don't have to make them now. You know what they are and you know what to look out for. If you got value in today's video, hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. That means the world. So thank you guys. That really helps out. And drop a comment. You know, which one was new to you maybe? I know some of them you already know. Maybe you didn't. Um, but I'm hoping that I tapped on here common mistakes that you can avoid in the future. Anyways, guys, that's all for this week's episode of Code with Josh. I'll see you next time, Python crew. Until then.